Okay, so you know, uh, starting from some uh, some sources uh, today, is San, San Francis uh, San Francis birthday. Um, but uh, I take this more as a pretext to to talk about um, about buildings that were built in his name or for him. So churches, churches uh, uh, built built for uh, built for San Francis. I once did myself a, a project for a competition. I was in the United States uh, for San Francisco, whose name of course derives from San Francis. And at that time I was very, very depressed and very, very uh, regressed and very, very against capi and, uh, capitalism. So in uh, the, the, the site of the competition was um, a square, an important square in San Francisco, which I, if I remember well, this was many years ago, was called uh, San Francis Square. And around it there were big uh, malls like Bloomingdale, uh, Macy's, and so on. So instead of doing some, something for the human being for, or for man, I filled that square, which was rectangular, uh, approximately, you know, mid-size uh, uh, square with uh, poles, uh, thin uh, slender poles of various uh, sizes between uh, 10 feet and six feet, um, no, between 10 feet and um, 15 feet, so between three meters and uh, four meters and a half or six meters, I forgot. Anyway, uh, slender uh, poles uh, and on top of each pole, I placed a small uh, little house for a bird. You know, a birdhouse, uh, the, the paradigmatic, paradigmatic little birdhouse. Because, you know, Sam Francis loved the birds and he was talking with the birds. So I imagined in the center of San Francisco, this so-called forest of birdhouses on top of slender poles. And that's all I did. And then later on, someone saw the project and told me, well, did you think about the droppings of the, essentially there were pigeons. And it's true, I didn't think of that, but um, he did have a point. Anyway, um, so let me, let me start with churches uh, or uh, yeah, uh, buildings uh, uh, built for, uh, for St. Francis. If it today is his birthday or not, I'm not sure, but on the 4th of October, it will be his death. He died on the, on the 4th of October, and I will probably talk again about him. This building in Spain um, attracted my attention because it, it is uh, rather uh, a little bit provocative, not, not a lot, but um, it, it was mentioned under this title, hybridization and evolution. And maybe, maybe um, you know, some people might protest against uh, this so-called hybridization or even evolution, but personally, I, I welcome it. And I, I try to explain why I welcome it. So it was an existing building here, an old building, not in the best shape, as you can see, even after the refurbishment. And this Spanish architect, um, uh, I guess this is the name or the name it doesn't, I don't know if it's Spanish or not. Uh, the, this uh, building uh, was built in San Pedro in Spain, David closes. Uh, and we can, we can talk and I'm, I'm open for, to, a, to a debate if you want about the, the intervention of this architect that uh, clearly uh, stands out in contrast with, uh, with the existing building. And I am asking myself, what is faith? What is religion? What is spirit? Uh, this building, the way it, 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 it is, the way it looks, it stirs up my curiosity. I would be curious to go, to go inside this building because it is, unsettling a little bit because of the contrast between the, 
the, the, the contemporary intervention and, uh, and the old world. Personally, I think religion goes through a crisis now. That's why there are, just in Great Britain, there are two buildings, you know, so-called sacred buildings that are desacralized each year. And I read this information a few years ago. Maybe now there are more than two years. Even the most celebrated Romanian architect, Dan Hanganu in Canada, he, well, through, through what he did, he desacralized two churches. One he transformed into a, into a library, and uh, the second one, I think, into a theater. I'm not sure about the second one, but in both cases, the churches lost the you know, original function. In this case, the church remained a church. It's just that the, the architectural language became, became uh, you know, uh, resolutely uh, modern. But I think it is engaging. I mean, this, this dialectic between um, the, the stone wall and uh, the new structure uh, is, 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 is dynamic. It, 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 uh, it, it forces you to, 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 to be engaged somehow. You, you, you cannot be indifferent. And I, I like dialectics in general. I like contrasts and I like provocation sometimes. So I personally like what is happening here although I didn't visit it, but even inside, if you look, there are modern interventions that express our time. This is our time. And um, uh, now, of course, it has to do with the subjectivity of its creator. Another architect would have created something else. Uh, but I don't think he, he did violence to, to the building, really. I mean, I think harmony through contrast uh, is, uh, is a possibility. I'm not saying it's the only possibility, but it is a possibility. And, uh, you know, we do live in the 21st century and, uh, you know, we use laptops, we talk on Zoom, uh, we go to Mars or to the moon or wherever, uh, we use the subway, we have cars, we have even bicycles. So, you know, our time is different from the time when the building was built, the original building, the stone building. And I think these uh, insertions of the new in the old, uh, in the old structure, are in this case, uh, not, uh, not, I mean, yes, of course, there is uh, some drama here, but I like this drama and it's even connected with the, uh, you know, the drama and the suffering of, of, of what religion means. I mean, you know, I don't know the details of, of the life of St. Francis, but I don't think he had a, a life that was um, devoid of, of, of some drama and some, you know, happenings that were not, uh, you know, uh, placid at all. From what I understood, he was born rich and uh, I forgot exactly what made him change completely. Uh, and this happened in, in, in other cases in history. I remember in, in Brazil, there is a, actually an architect and an artist, a sculptor, Alei Jardinio, the little cripple in translation, who was also well-to-do and he contracted a terrible illness. I mean, he was only partying and having fun in life. Uh, his father was a Portuguese architect and his mother, um, a mulatto woman, I think, from Brazil anyway. And he contracted a, an illness which almost killed everybody. He was not killed, but he lost his limbs. And uh, he changed dramatically. You know, he, he became totally devoted to art. And there, are, there is an, uh, an incredible uh, church he built and uh, he also built, uh, Ale Giardino built, uh, I mean, sculpted uh, the, the figures, the statues of the prophets. So he transformed suffering into art, into the joy of art. And, you know, this kind of an example illustrates that perhaps in the case of many 
saints and many artists. Now, I'm not saying that artists are saints. Often they are the opposite. They are sinners, if, if we are to use this word. But on the other hand, they probably do have a saint-like, uh, you know, psychology or, you know, their total devotion, you know, against whatever society says, against even uh, not having anything to eat. So a true artist, if the artist is true, appears, he or she appears to be different from a saint, but from another point of view, maybe the differences are not big. Um, wasn't even Brinkush called uh, at one point, at least a saint of Montmartre or something like this, although he was far from being a saint. Now, if we look at this building, and we look at the intervention, the modern intervention, to me is engaging, you know, and I even see here where I don't expect it, a cross, and it's structural, but it's also, you know, uh, visually and symbolically, uh, obviously referring to, to the function of the building. So it is creative, and I keep saying, if God was and is creative, and if man is the creation that is similar to, to, to God, you know, resembles, resembles, or is that supposed to resemble God, even or mainly in his actions, then man has to be creative too. And when man is not creative, in my opinion, that is a betrayal of uh, maybe even of his raison d'etre on us. So this architect, in my opinion, was creative. Now we might like or we might not like what he did, but he was creative. And I like this tension between the ruin and the new interventions. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, I think it's harmony through contrast. And it is a clear contrast. And I like this, this the fact that, you know, he has, you know, almost smooth uh, surfaces or parts of the building, and then very rough, raw actually, raw, R-A-W, uh, in, the, in the most genuine uh, sense of the word. Anyway, if this relates factually to the life of St. Francis, I don't know, but um, somehow in the contrast between the modernity of, of the new intervention and the old wall, I seem to see some, some of the tensions that perhaps animated the life of St. Francis also. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm subjective, of course. Someone, uh, someone else could think in a different way. Uh, in this case, the old, the old building was sufficiently deteriorated and uh, there was no question of a style that one has to submit to. So I guess the primitivism of the old structure admitted, uh, you know, even an intervention like the one, like the one we see now. But in my opinion, a saint is an other par excellence is, you know, his modus vivendi is completely other, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we think about extraterrestrials, well, any uh, saint, just like a yogi in India, uh, is, uh, is an almost uh, extraterrestrial being, you know, to be on earth a saint or to be on earth a yogi means to turn your back to so-called normal life. After all, St. Francis talked with the birds. How many so-called mortal beings talk with birds? I don't know of many, but I know of some who shoot birds. Uh, that's very different from talking to birds. Anyway. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in religion. I'm not an expert in San Francis, but uh, I admire uh, non-conventional lives, uh, uh, especially those which are dedicated uh, to, to even uh, uh, 
an uncomfortable truth, you know, the truth of one's convictions, the truth of one's, um, you know, beliefs. And uh, in my opinion, the architect here did a good job, you know, because he, he didn't try to mimic an obedience which was not necessary. And, they, you know, he had these interventions which were clearly his. And I'm, I'm surprised this image is moving because, yes, it was moving on Google Images, but I didn't expect it to move also on the, on the PowerPoint presentation. So anyway, welcome, welcome to technologies. This is how the building looked like in the past. Now, we are talking about Spain, and in Spain there is, uh, you know, apparently there is space. But look, there were cars parked inside the, 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 the old uh, church. Can you believe it? We we're just talking at the beginning about the assault of cars on earth. Well, we arrived to the cars even inside the church. I mean, isn't it incredible? I think it is. So probably the, the drivers, the former drivers of these cars, they all claim that they believe in God, right? Well, you know, is it truly a uh, faith or a mimicked faith? Anyway, I, I, you know, if I look at this and I look at this, I, I would say that, uh, you know, this building was uh, restored to some dignity by the architect with a necessary uh, so-called modern uh, uh, betrayals, if we are to call them so. But I still feel that there is, there was respect. And I, 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 I perceive a certain level of dignity in the image on the right. Now, San Francesco Formentera, this is another building, it's on an island. A uh, little island. It attracted my attention uh, because of its very simple facade. Um, I think it works. You know, it's just a square white uh, main elevation with a door, an entrance door. That's it. Uh, maybe here it's a little brasserie or something where pe people drink uh, beer or whatever. And uh, well, what can we do? Life. Life on Earth is complex. It has both sides, you know. Here is space. Here is uh, Budweiser, or who knows what. Anyway, I just uh, I, I I brought together some examples of churches um, dedicated to to Saint Francis. Now, Eglise Saint Francois, uh, this is in French, in France, uh, the church uh, for Saint, Saint Francis. Um, I could have searched more, it's true. Um, anyway, for this, I only had two, two pictures, but we'll come back to something else also in France. But now we arrive at this church, which I think is very important by Oscar Niemeyer. Um, uh, Church of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, and this is what he declared, I deliberately disregarded the right angle and rationalist architecture designed with ruler and square to boldly enter the world of curves and straight lines offered by reinforced concrete. And this was a very early work by him. It might even be that it was the first building he built in the reinforced concrete. And um, I like it. I think it's a courageous, uh, if I can say so, a courageous uh, religious building. And uh, I wonder why in our country we, uh, we, don't, we, we are not allowed to have a similar, uh, similar courage. Um, yeah, Oscar Niemeyer was a, a rather interesting architect. Uh, and uh, here he states about his uh, inspiration. Inspiration was drawn from the words of the French poet Paul Claudel. A church is God's hunger on earth. Um, I like when the inspiration to a building derives from other fields, poetry or something else. I think the interaction between architecture and other fields 
uh, can be very nourishing. The translation of which is very well materialized in the design of the church. He used a form, so the statement was, this statement is not by him. He used a form that was a combination of what hangars were designed like, and the idea of replicating the mountainous landscape of Brazil, which was quite literally also the backdrop of the site of the church. Curves are the essence of my work because they are the essence of Brazil, pure and simple, Oscar Niemeyer. Well, curves were also of interest to him because he was a very sensuous man, a sensual man. Anyway, but a good architect, Oscar Niemeyer, although sometimes maybe a little bit uh, formalistic, but um, still I don't think we can, uh, we can ignore him. You see, it was built with uh, primitive uh, technology, essentially. You know, uh, look at the building uh, during uh, its uh, erection, and you can tell, uh, you know, this was not built by a big uh, construction company with, uh, you know, extremely sophisticated tools at its disposal. But the building stands out because of the freshness of vision. And it even has a beautiful artwork, in my opinion, illustrating the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, we are going to see that. I think it's the, the, the Eastern uh, facade. So you enter the building uh, on the West side and uh, that artwork is on the, uh, on the East side. Here it is. So these are scenes uh, of St. Francis. You will see here St. Francis, uh, you know, there is an animal here, there is an angel or something, but the language is modern and it has to be modern because, because uh, Brazil at that time was in the 20th century, for God's sake. He couldn't, he couldn't mimic, you know, something built in a previous or other century. And I think he did a good job and so did the artists that he invited to uh, create this um, you know, large scale uh, mural. Bravo to them. You know, I, I, I continue to think that a building which says yes to life and is creative is, uh, is the way to go in architecture. Always, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, what you build for, what, what function you serve with the building. The building, this was built uh, probably 70 years ago. Uh, you know, so probably even before the Second World War and still looks fresh. If this building was built today, it would be published everywhere. Uh, and uh, this marriage between the freshness of the, the architectural vision and the, and, the, and, the, and the freshness of the artistic or plastic vision of the artist who did this work is excellent. You know, it's figurative, it's narrative. You see here St. Francis of Assisi with birds, but the, but the artistic language belongs to our time or anyway, close to our time. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, you, can you imagine if you allow the imagination of architects and artists to, to, to bloom, to, to express itself freely what churches we would have in this country. I think we would have had beautiful churches, but because of the dogma of the institution we call church, we have the stereotypical buildings repeated ad infinitum. It's very sad. What can we say? Anyway, but in his case, Oscar Niemeyer is giving us a lesson about what architecture is, and I would say is giving us a lesson even about what faith is. You know, because I don't know what you feel, but I, when I look at this image, I, I, I do believe in God, I do believe in creation, I do believe in nature, I do believe in creativity, I do believe in architecture, and it gives me hope. It's not, it's not, yes, maybe not everything is perfect, yet you would say, wait a minute, is this a church? It's truly a hunger, as uh, Paul Claudel, uh, you know, said that uh, a church is God's hunger 
It's, I don't know if it's God's hunger. It does look like a hunger. Yes, it's true. It's a gathering place. It's a big room where people enter and I'm glad there are no chairs. In this sense, it's not very comfortable, but then should you sit on a chair in front of God? And here are some scenes from the, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, the artwork. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think it's a good building and I think it's, it's an excellent artwork. Did Brazil have 70 years ago uh, a lot of money? I don't think so. It's still considered kind of a, you know, third world country. Uh, so it's not about money really, it's about the vision you have. And uh, this was not an expensive building. It's not, uh, you know, no, it's a building which uh, was allowed to be creative. And uh, Oscar Niemeyer uh, took his chance. And uh, that's why we talk about it today, because uh, I think it's a very nice homage to San Francis. And I think San Francis would have loved it. This is what I believe. Of course, without being able to know or to verify. Reinforced concrete, you know, with the freedom of shaping the building as he felt like it. And, uh, and then the, the artist uh, bringing his talent to this um, uh, elevation. And it worked well, I think. Now the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi in Italy is uh, an important destination in Italy and apparently the, the remains of uh, St. Francis are there in this building. And there are great artworks by great artists themselves innovators because a great artist is also an innovator. Even Andrei Rubliov in Russia, a painter of icons was an innovator, you know. Those who think that uh, you can be a, a, an artist without innovating anything, I doubt it. No, uh, a great artist brings something new. Uh, and, uh, and here we have some, some great artists, Giotto, Cimabue, uh, you know, is the building, I don't know who built the building, but uh, it's a very important destination in the town of Assisi because apparently the remnants of the remains of the, of, of, of the saint are also here. Uh, and it's a building with two levels, kind of two different uh, uh, sacred spaces within the same building. Uh, we are going to see some pictures with it. You see the power of spirit. We are talking about the 12th, the 13th century, you know, when, when uh, the Saint uh, uh, Saint Francis, when Saint Francis lived, and we are in the 21st century, so eight centuries later. This is the power of spirit. It transcends time, and it transcends even space. And I think this is also the power of art. And um, initially, I read art and religion were one. In fact, art was a form of worshiping. Through art, you worshiped, you know, the, the divine, the divinity you believed in. And when religion and art became divorced, it was the opinion of two formidable artists, modern artists, Auguste Rodin and Ingmar Bergman. They both said the same thing almost in identical terms. Religion and art died when they became separated and they are separated now. Although I think great artists do have in their own personal, sometimes difficult way, a connection with, um, with, uh, with the primordial questions and inevitably I would say with some, some kind of engagement with what we call the divine. You are going, we are going to see also pictures um, uh, from scenes from the life of uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, painted by Giotto. 
uh, the the artist, uh, the the Gothic artist who made some steps in the direction of uh, of the Renaissance, announcing the Renaissance. He even built because that's how it was at the time. An artist was also able to build if he had attraction to architecture and if he proved himself in this sense. Something impossible today in our country. I'm sure there are artists with talent who could build very interesting buildings, but they are not allowed to build because they don't have the so-called right to signature. Well, Giotto had it in Florence. The Campanile near uh, Santa Maria del Fiore was built by Giotto, a painter. Why is it we cannot do the same? Because of bureaucracy, that's why. We are highly bureaucratized and we don't believe any longer that someone could build if he or she has the talent, allow them to manifest themselves. You know, uh, allowing them this would only benefit the country and the culture, not just of the country, but if the art is good of the whole world. No, the bureaucrat says no. He didn't study architecture, so he cannot build. Fortunately, there are other cities and other countries like Austria, like Vienna, where Fritz Wotruba built a beautiful church, very modern and expressionistic in Vienna. And he was a sculptor and a painter like Unterwasser built several buildings, both in uh, Austria and Germany. Uh, in my opinion, they are more open-minded than we are here. Anyway, much more open-minded. We are extremely rigid. Anyway, uh, so let me read. One of the most important places of Christian pilgrimage in Italy, the Basilica of St. Francis in, in Assisi, is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, welcoming visitors as a distinctive landmark as they approach the Umbrian town, birthplace of Francis. So he was born there. The Basilica of St. Francis was built starting from 1228, just two years after Francis' death, as a place destined to guard the saint's remains. The first stone was placed by Pope Gregory IX on the 17th July 20, 20, 1228, the day after the canonization of Francis. According to tradition, Francis himself, as he was nearing his death, indicated that location to his Franciscan brothers as the place for his burial. Halfway down the nave of the lower church is the access into the crypt, which contains the tomb of St. Francis, a simple sarcophagus placed on a rock. In the lower half of the nave of the upper church is the most, the famous cycle of frescoes by Giotto depicting episodes from the life of St. Francis from his youth to his death, as well as his alleged posthumous miracles. And this is the, 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 the space where the Giotto frescoes are. Apparently there is some controversy. Uh, some people think that they might not be uh, Giotto's because there are uh, stylistic differences between his work here and his work in Padua. Um, but um, things are not settled, but whatever. The frescoes are uh, impressive. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking about narrative architecture, well, this is what it is. It's a building, but the walls depict the life of St. Francis. Even at night now, these are projections on the facade of the building. But I do think there is potential for a narrative architecture. That is a, an architecture which tells a story. Let's say you build a little house for a bookkeeper, right? A bookkeeper. He is not a saint. He's a bookkeeper. But anyone has a specific biography with its own specificities. So let's say the architect invites the bookkeeper for a discussion, maybe at a coffee with a mask on now that there is a pandemic and you begin to talk and you ask the bookkeeper, well, uh, tell me something about you, about your life, about your family, about your preferences, about your hobbies, about your attraction, I imagine, towards numbers. 
and, and so on. And you find out certain things from the life or about the life of your client. And then try to express something, you know, perhaps in abstract terms, in symbolic terms, something that connects with the life of, of your client. Express it through your building. Why not? In that way, the building says something about its inhabitant. The falling water building, the famous building by Frank Lloyd Wright, says absolutely nothing about the life uh, of uh, the Kaufman family. Nothing. Except that, of course, he was commissioned by them. Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier says nothing about the Savoie family. Nothing. So, you know, didn't we, don't we impoverish architecture in this way? I think we do. So, but here, this church, of course, was not built with these projections in mind. These are, you know, contemporary interventions. But I think, uh, you know, they work together. Here is a building whose construction started in the 13th century, but eight centuries later, or almost eight centuries later, here you have scenes, you know, uh, connecting with, um, you know, uh, the life of the spirit in Christianity uh, appropriately uh, present on the, on the facade of the building. And now you can see some of the frescoes apparently done by Giotto. Uh, there are books, of course, like here, you know, Giotto and the San Francis of Assisi cycle. Um, some, some frescoes are more related to other works known by him, others a little bit less. But again, in my opinion, we impoverished uh, architecture uh, dramatically by divorcing ourselves or our buildings from painting, from sculpture, and from narration. We don't narrate anything through our buildings. Our buildings are mute. They don't say anything, even about the inhabitants of them. Now, this, you know, the life of a saint is a fantastic life. That's why he is a saint. You know, it's, 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 it's a life which is uh, not belonging just to the earth. It belongs also to other realms. You know, a, a saint believes into a dual reality, if I, can, if I can say so. Something most of us we do not do. Um, So these are from the cycle Jotos, let's say, Jotos cycle, uh, the life of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. <clears throat> Giotto lived a little bit later than, uh, than uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi was dead at the time when Giotto was active. Here he is talking with the birds. And I personally think we need more people who can talk with the birds, or at least who attempt to understand that the human being is not really the center of life. There are other many things around himself that need to be acknowledged, trees, birds, and so on. Angels, why not? Even angels, yes. When, when I look at, at the, at the silhouette, at the presentation, the illustration of, of St. Francis here, I am asking myself, what, how many things do we actually need, you know, in order to live? You know, he doesn't even have shoes the way he is presented here. He, he, he had a life reduced to, you know, uh, almost poverty. He had nothing. You know, I, I, I remember Brinkush claiming that he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was in a way, uh, Milarepa is reborn. And Milarepa was a Persian poet uh, who, a mystic who had nothing. He lived in a cave 
and he was rest, you know, laying on a on a on a rug, on a on a piece of cloth, you know, fabric that was ripped off and miserable. And he wrote a little poem where he said, "People are afraid of thieves, but uh, I'm not afraid of thieves." You know, I mean, if a if a thief enters my cave, what would he take away from me? The you know the miserable piece of cloth that I have underneath me. So, you know, essentially, if we come down to the bottom of it, we don't need a lot of things. You can uh, eat even, uh, you know, occasionally almost, and, uh, you know, have almost nothing and, and actually be freer. I have seen homeless people who sing on the streets and I had seen businessmen, probably very well to do, extremely stern and, know, apparently very unhappy and tense. So there, you know, you could have nothing and be free and sing and you could have a lot of things and then spend your, your life, you know, uh, securing them with the para paraphernalia of protection of which Rem Kolhas talked about once. Anyway, um, so St. Francis, and now the, the, the space of the church where the, the, the frescoes of uh, probably, probably Giotto, but even if it was not Giotto, it's maybe not so important. The important thing is that in the hometown of St. Francis of Assisi, in the church bearing his name, there is a large room with frescoes depicting his life. And this is a triumph of the spirit in itself. You see, in today's world, we don't have a dialogue between the earth and the above. We don't believe in angels, really. We don't, uh, there is no uh, duality. There is no dual life, you know? And I think in this sense, our life is very, very poor, very impoverished. You know, we, when we lift our eyes towards the above, what do we see? Maybe some planes, but, but we certainly don't see any longer angels. We don't even believe in them. And, um, you know, uh, being a world that is desacralized, uh, essentially we have to, uh, you know, accept, uh, uh, you know, a very limited uh, kind of life. While here, you know, it was the imaginative was very, very present. You know, it was real, you know, just like for the old Greeks, you know, the presence of the gods was real, was not imagined, was real. Uh, well, uh, I guess, yes, we have uh, uh, an admirable longevity these days, but I think something is missing. Now, who is that uh, person there climbing in the tree? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, life, life like always was and always will be perhaps, except that in these frescoes by Giotto or not Giotto, you don't see any car. Uh, you see birds, you see trees, you see the saint, the future saint, because at that time he was not uh, sanctified, canonized, he was later after his death. Uh, yeah. Now we arrive at uh, St. Francis of Assisi Kirche, meaning church in Vienna, quite a large building. Look at this. <laughs> now, I don't know. I mean, you know, St. Francis was the most modest saint perhaps ever. And this church is far from being modest. But, you know, if we think about contrasts, maybe we could say, why not build a sumptuous, majestic, uh, a church for the most modest of all saints. It's possible to, the important thing perhaps is the, the homage, the veneration, the, the respect, the affection towards someone who deserves them. But, uh, the building itself, uh, yes, it's in a powerful city of Europe. And uh, in, in a way it expresses the triumph of spirit over the centuries manifested physically. Maybe in a, you know, a little bit of rhetorical terms, but uh, anyway. 
The interior maybe is not so, you know, monumental and surprising. We've had been many churches. I will show also some churches from Romania, smaller churches, which I think are very nice and um, surprisingly somehow, even for me, fresh. Now, this is the church. I was talking about it uh, in Sibiu, the, the town where I was born in Romania. It's, it's a church which with touches of, uh, of uh, Baroque, Baroque art. And really, if you compare this church in Vienna, glorious as it is towards the outside, with this church much smaller and much more modest in Sibiu, and of course, uh, you cannot compare uh, easily Sibiu with Vienna, you know, a small town in Transylvania and uh, one of the most important cities in Europe and the world. And yet, this church, I think, shows a, a surprising and positive uh, inventiveness in terms of forms and the touches of Baroque sensibility, I think, are, are, are convincing. I like, I like this interior. The exterior is rather, you know, simple and stern, but even this perhaps is, is, is a good thing, you know, as somehow relating to who San Francis was, who was a, a very modest man. Uh, at least he became so. Uh, I don't think it's bad. He, even the old parts of the, I mean, you know, the building that was not uh, refurbished yet. I, I, uh, I think there is a level of genuineness that, that I personally, personally like. Now, maybe I'm also nostalgic or patriotic a little bit is possible. Now, uh, monastery, Francis, Franciscan monastery in Lazaria, also in, in Romania. Uh, I, 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 with, with the pleasure, I, I discovered these, um, these places because I think faith can happen anywhere in the world and it has nothing to do with money. You can uh, very genuinely pay homage to spirit, to God in the simplest possible way. In, I, I even think it's preferable to, to have nothing, you know, so the, the thought is pure. So you, you, you can have a monastery in a, in a, in a place, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't hear of until I discovered this monastery uh, on the web. And look, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's um, you know, in a, in a beautiful uh, natural uh, landscape. So in itself, the landscape is, a, is an homage to San Francis. Another Franciscan mon monastery in Vinsu de Jos, also in Romania. Uh, yes, I say yes. You know, it's a simple uh, architectonic gesture. It's, um, it moves me, you know, because again, spirit has nothing to do with the, you know, the, the dimensions of the pocket meaning with what is inside the pocket. You can have genuine faith everywhere, anytime, irrespective of, you know, if you uh, are affluent or not. Now we arrive at the building and I don't know if Janos is still here. Maybe if he wants, he can say something about it. I only show some images. I never visited Odor Sekuyesk, which is a town an interesting town, it seems, in Transylvania, in Romania, uh, the Franciscan church, and it's not this time a very small building. Uh, you look at it, it, it has, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a proud building. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a building uh, aware of its, um, you know, uh, dignity and of its uh, destination. There is one also in Cluj, and I am going to show images of that uh, building as well. So you see in these images that I show, and it's just the beginning of a presentation, and I, I intend to develop it, to amplify it. It moves me to see that in various places of the world, you have gestures of affection towards a man who was different. St. Francis was different. In what way was he different? Well, he became different actually because he understood that the goal of life 
is not to accumulate riches or to watch TV day and night or to play games or I don't know what. You know, there are other reasons one can find in life. Yes, even talking with the birds. Why not? Maybe the birds enjoy talking with the human beings, do we know? Or even trees. Why not? You know, why not have affection for trees as well? Uh, this building uh, again shows, you know, I, I showed a few buildings previously. I mean, this interior to me is richer than uh, the interior of that uh, majestic, uh, um, you know, church in Vienna dedicated to St. Francis. Why? Because of these touches of artistry, which are, uh, in my opinion, uh, very sensitive and delicate and uh, I think in themselves are an homage to the otherness of a saint or the otherness of the life of a saint and the otherness of art. And, and the outside, yes, is, um, you know, uh, rather clean and simple, but it has dignity. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good building. And I think Odor Heusekwe should be proud of this building. And it probably is. It doesn't need my uh, encouragements. So now I show the Franciscan uh, church in Cluj, which is one of the oldest and the most uh, significant uh, um, cult buildings uh, in, in Cluj. Uh, so um, I don't know about this, you know, with Maria Sapesi, with the Mary of, of Snow, but it is the Franciscan church. And uh, just like the building in Odorheu Sekuyesk, it stands out uh, through its uh, spire, through its uh, verticality. And uh, in, in this, to me, it symbolizes the triumph of spirit. And the interior, yes, is a little bit more elaborate. Uh, the Gothic uh, accents, so to speak, are more than just accents. Um, you can tell, you know, it's a bigger city, a bigger. Uh, you know, audience, so to speak, be the bigger populace, but population. But uh, uh, the, I think the, the, there is a colorfulness about the, 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 the Baroque side of, of the interior, which is, um, I think, uh, joyous. An old picture, and I like uh, I like these um, these uh, old pictures. Why? Mainly because I don't see cars. I truly think uh, you know uh, cities without cars um, would uh, would uh, look much more interesting. But uh, we don't have the chance to see them like this very often, uh, if at all. And like here, you know. Uh, Yeah, Cluj, Transylvania, an important city in Transylvania. Okay, and now we go to the second subject uh, that I thought of talking about a little bit today, and that is uh, Heidegger, but uh, because it is his birthday today, Martin Heidegger was born today, so I thought of talking, it is not a very ample uh, presentation, but I feel it's perhaps uh, worthy of talking a little bit about this aspect of Heidegger, of Martin Heidegger. I read a little bit Heidegger. Again, I'm very far away from being an expert in Heidegger. But uh, I mentioned him in some of my writings, uh, also in his uh, you know, connection, in a way, with Friedrich Nietzsche. 
But in, in this case, in the case of this presentation, and by the way, let's wish him happy birthday. Uh, I would like to compare his, uh, his own uh, home in his later years, the so-called Heidegger's hut, with Le Corbusier's hut, the Le Cabanon in the south of France. I read, of course, I know that Heidegger was accused of being, uh, you know, uh, involved with the Nazism, uh, uh, you know, and uh, there was criticism uh, at times uh, very, very uh, pointed uh, towards him in this sense. In my opinion, uh, the artists and intellectuals and maybe even philosophers um, politically are um, sometimes troubled in the sense that I don't think necessarily a great mind and a great artist or a great philosopher or a great writer like Knut Hamsun, who also wrote apparently, uh, you know, letters of admiration to Hitler, and he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. I don't think these people are necessarily politically astute or even very aware, or uh, I'm not trying to excuse them. And sometimes I ask myself very seriously, how come that a brilliant mind like uh, André de Reims or uh, Knut Hamsuls or Heidegger's allow uh, them to, 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 you know, even uh, have a moderately positive uh, uh, relationship with, uh, with the monstrous uh, realities that uh, the Nazis uh, brought to, to existence. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. You know, even a North American architect, and I would say, uh, uh, not a man with the with the lowest uh, IQ, like Philip Johnson. He also flirted, uh, in fact, explicitly. He was very admirative to towards uh, the Nazi movement. How to explain it? How to explain it? It's 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 very difficult. Um, but so, you know, I'm not trying to say that politics are not important, are very important, they are. And, uh, you know, the decisions one makes in the political field are also the responsibility of the one who makes them. There is no excuse here. There is no way out of this. We have to assume the responsibilities of our um, choices. But for today, uh, being that it is his birthday, I want to show a little bit some images from his uh, later part of his life after the war in a very modest building that he chose to live in together with his wife. And it was called uh, Heidegger's uh, hut, where he didn't have, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, running water. He didn't have, uh, you know, probably even heat. There was no, it was a building almost completely devoid of all the comforts that today we take for granted. So Heidegger's hut, uh, it, it's not the smallest building really, but it's not very large either. And uh, it looks more flattering in this picture than in uh, all the pictures uh, from the time when, uh, when Heidegger actually lived. He was taking the water, you know, from here and bringing to the to the house. Um, there was no bathroom there, I think. No, uh, you know, all, all the facilities that we have today, he didn't have. And here is the man. I, I actually like very much Martin Heidegger in this picture. I mean, you you wouldn't expect a philosopher to look like him. You know, he looks, uh, you know, almost like a teenager. I think he looks very young somehow in spirit, although in age, I don't think he was very young. And of course, he has the peculiarities of uh, um, well-behaved German. You know, he has a tie and a white shirt, although he is living in the forest almost, you know. But look at the expression of his face. I like the expression of his face. Now, you would say, is this expression appropriate for someone who, you know, flirted with Nazism, if not more than flirting and considering the horrors of the Second World War? 
I would say it's a legitimate question. But then should one remain morose for the rest of one's life? You know, and uh, I guess he took revenge on maybe on his very own wrong choices and on the on the on the on the fatalities of a very grave tragedy through his work, which is his philosophy. And uh, even the most uh, critical uh, adversaries of Heidegger do have to acknowledge that in the field of architect of uh, philosophy, he was a force. Martin Heidegger was a force, a major force. His political, but I don't know, I'm not trying to say again that his political choices should be totally disregarded, no. But his philosophy, in my opinion, transcends um, you know, the limitations and the vagaries of uh, localized uh, you know, uh, field of, uh, of, of politics. Even Nietzsche was uh, appropriated by the Nazis. And paradoxically, because Nietzsche found as a port parole for him, Zarathustra, who was derived from Zoroaster. So <laughs> Zoroaster was, was, you know, and, and uh, Zoroaster didn't belong to the, uh, the white, uh, blonde, uh, European, uh, you know, perfect man at all. So, you know, it, it's very strange in a way that both Heidegger and Nietzsche are uh, considered to be associated, uh, you know, explicitly or implicitly with that um, uh, catastrophic you know, political party and military monster that the Nazism, Nazism, Nazism was. But coming back to Heidegger and to his posture here and to his face, I don't know. I am subjective, but I like the man. I mean, even the, I mean, the coat, you know, is, which is traditionalist and maybe he bought it from a second hand store. It's something about him. It's like you, you can tell that this man who obviously was able to think very rigorously was uh, also playful and childlike in a way. And I think this is actually the case. If you want to create, doesn't matter, in art, in philosophy, in mathematics, you do have to have a child in you or to be childlike. And that's what his expression seems to uh, evoke to me. Anyway, here, even here, you know, he has a cane, you know, here is the great philosopher. Look at the entrance into, into his heart. You know, I mean, what architect today would live like this or what so-called normal being, you know, most people today would, 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 would find it outrageous to live like this. Even in Romania. Now, who lives like this? Look at his door. I mean, Neufert himself would tremble probably would say, wait a minute, you know, there is no vestibule. He entered just straight into the room and uh, look at those uh, little windows. But you'll see that actually between Heidegger and Le Corbusier is not a long distance at all in terms of their own houses. And I wish there were more architects present at this presentation because we are so obsessed to have our own house and villa and cars and all, all that rest, all the rest. But here we have one of the most brilliant people of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, and not much later, we are going to see one of the most brilliant artists and architects of the 20th century, that is Le Corbusier, living in very, very similar ways. So there, if Heidegger, a brilliant mind and philosopher, was able to live like this, why can't we? Would anyone explain to me? Of course, we'd say, wait a minute, you know, this is no civilization. He doesn't have water in the house. He probably doesn't have a bathroom. You know, uh, how did he live? Well, he lived. <laughs> he lived, and we talk about him and his philosophy is one of the best in the world ever. Look at the great philosopher, of course. He would not give up on his tie and white shirt. But, but it's something very moving that in these simple gestures, picking up some water from, from this fountain here and bringing it to his wife, of course, the malicious ones like Mark Wigley, the curator of the show, the deconstructivist, 
attacked um, Heidegger in a, in a lecture I actually attended in New York. It was uh, it it had its title uh, Martin Heidegger and the violence of the domestic or the domesticity because uh, he was accused that he was uh, you know kind of indulging in the in the you know uh, certain exploitation of his wife that he his wife was cooking while he was writing philosophical systems. Well, it is true. But there was a division of work. He was working, as you can see, and she was working too. And I guess they got along very well. And it's not our business what they decided to do. Um, anyway, otherwise, yes, uh, you know, a splendid uh, vista. Um, hello, Monsieur, uh, Mr. Heidegger. Happy birthday to you again. You see, this is a human being acting like a human being, without question, a brilliant mind, a very learned man, being not uh, embarrassed to do what, what you see he's doing here. And why can't we do something similar? All of us. If a great mind and a great philosopher can do it, why can't we? And here he is. Yes, yes, it's true. The man is sitting and contemplating the gods on, on, on the sky. And his wife is making, uh, preparing dinner or something. Uh, yes, it's true. But he was also working, uh, you know, in his own way. So I think his, the criticism towards him was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, ill-intentioned, so to speak. Anyway, I do believe there is a lesson of wisdom in this modus vivendi, in the way these people live. I think just, and it's not, totally by accident or is not totally irrelevant that we, we, we look at these things, at these images, after we looked at some churches dedicated to St. Francis. I think St. Francis would have understood Heidegger and Heidegger would have understood St. Francis. And they both live kind of similarly in a very, very, very simple way. Why can't we? This is my question. Why can't we live you know, modestly on the earth and under the sky. Because this is mainly the point, under the sky. Now we plan to go to Mars, where you can't even ride a bicycle in shorts. You know, why would, would we do this? Where the trip to the earth, to Mars, it, it's uh, six months or eight months long. It's incredible, you know, instead of enjoying life here on the earth, which is a privileged place. The earth is a privileged place. And, uh, and, and we don't appreciate it. Um, so there are strange things, you know, it's like we, I, we looked at this picture again, although I feel like looking at it all the time because I do like the man. This is the man who conquered the passage of time. You can tell from his face. I mean, his face gives me joy. <laughs> Because, because he's saying to us, you know, uh, move on, you know, go on, don't, uh, don't despair. Uh, there is beauty, there is life, in, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, beauty in, uh, in life, and it's, it's worth going on. And don't, don't forget to be playful. So um, now I'm going to surprise you with this image, which surprised me when I first saw it. There are two so-called great men, or at least one of them, well, they are both considered great. In my opinion, one is greater than the others, but maybe I should, I should abstain from such uh, differentiations. Do you know who is the one on the left? Do you know who is the one on the right? Maybe you imagine who is the one on the right, but you don't know who is the one on the left. Although you see the, some kind of a, a drawing, a kind of like a plan of a house or something, well, I'm going to show you the, the pictures. Uh, they, they were, they were pre presented, uh, or this picture was, was, was taken from this, uh, from this website. And here they are, Peter Zumthor on the left and my, Martin Heidegger on the right. Now, now, Martin Heidegger on the right doesn't look so, you know, uh, teenage-like anymore. He looks like rather very determined and willful. Uh, I don't know, maybe I should abstain now from commenting on, on, on the two. In my opinion, uh, and uh, yes, I'm subjective and I could be accused that I allow myself such subjectivity. 
But I don't think the, the, the heights of, uh, of Peter Eisen, uh, Peter Zumthor are as impressive as the heights of Heidegger. Uh, of course, it's difficult to compare an architect with a philosopher. But um, I think in our times, we are very tempted by superficiality and by scandalous uh, um, you know, analogies and uh, comparisons and so on. It remains to be seen. I, 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 I think the, the greatness of, of, of philosophy that uh, Heidegger arrived at is still to be matched, not by the work of uh, just the work of Peter Zumthor, but uh, maybe many other architects, if not all of them uh, in our time. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. It's risky what I'm saying, I'm aware. But I'm asking myself, why is it that these two men are brought together. I, it, it was not me who made this picture. You know, somebody thought about it as if, as if Peter Zumthor is some kind of a mystic, a wise man, uh, almost a saint. And in my opinion, he is not. Uh, and uh, it's not. I think it's a misleading uh, appreciation of uh, Peter Zumthor. I, 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 I don't think. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I know he, he likes to cultivate this persona, the, the lonely architect who lives in a, in, a, in a village with only 100 people, uh, and he only depicts himself alone, you know, smoking or not smoking, working with one foot on a chair and with the other drawing, with a, with a hand drawing on a yellow tracing paper. There are no people, there is no office, it's just him. Come on, Mr. Pastor Peter Zumthor. You know very well, you don't build all those buildings all by yourself. Uh, but anyway, today is not the time to talk about Peter Zumthor. It just amused me that, uh, or provoked me a little bit, the fact that architects in general uh, are tempted to see some uh, possible uh, correspondence or, uh, or you know, analogy or relationship between uh, Martin Heidegger and um, their beloved uh, Peter Zumthor. Here is uh, again uh, uh, <laughs> the philosopher. Uh, yes, he doesn't look again here, but he was probably in his 80s or so, or you know, late 70s, but working, working, yes, working uh, at his uh, systems, at his uh, philosophical system. He was a thinker. And this was his desk, you know, uh, and look at the window and please remember this window, because we are going to see a, a surprising image of, um, of a room not very different from this one which belonged to Le Corbusier. And what do we see on these shelves, you know, re really some, you know, banalities, I'm not including the little rocks here, the little stone uh, under the name of banalities, but again, what is shown here is that within very modest quarters, one can do brilliant work. It's very possible. Look at his bathroom. Uh, bedroom. Uh, the door doesn't even open probably completely because of the proximity of the edge of the bed. Uh, <laughs> you wonder, how come? Now, of course, he still has the tie and the white uh, shirt. What can you do? You know, certain things cannot change. Um, yeah, that's how the greatest, uh, probably the greatest philosopher of, uh, in Europe in the 20th century uh, lived uh, in his later years. And he was famous enough, he could have afforded a different kind of life. He chose to live in this way. Here he is walking through the forest and thinking, thinking. Now I read, but I'm not sure, uh, Plato and Nietzsche had opposite understandings of when thinking is possible. One of them said, when you work, you cannot think. And the other one said, you can only truly think when you walk. But I don't, I don't know, unfortunately, and I excuse myself, who said what? But these were the two statements. Probably Heidegger would have said, you can only think truly, authentically when you walk. And he, here he is walking, seen from, from, from behind. So again, you know, do we need a lot in order to have a full life, a fulfilling life? I don't think so. 
you just need a cane if you have some difficulties to walk and you just walk and you think you have the reaches of your mind which cannot be diminished or uh, dwarfed or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, how to say discarded in the in the name of uh, the reaches material reaches no the, the the reaches of the mind and of the soul are infinite they are not measurable while the other ones having to do with the pocket, they are measurable. And you cannot compare the measurable with the immeasurable. Hello, Mr. Uh, Mr. Heidegger, happy birthday to you. Otherwise you see his desk is very organized. You know, he is German after all. A view through the window, a beautiful view, I would say, if, if uh, of course, he didn't see our uh, very annoying Alami uh, on, or, or ornaments on the, on the picture, good for him. And now we arrive at Le Corbusier's hut. So we saw the headquarters, if we can say so, the quarters, the house, the hut of Heidegger, and now we are going to see Le Corbusier's hut, because it was a hut. Can you believe that Le Corbusier, and this is him, was looking through a window like the one you see here? So where is the horizontal, dogmatically modern or modernistic window? Where is it? This is a window like my grandmother had. You know, what happened to Le Corbusier on the wall? You see sketches for Chandigarh. So the great architect was working uh, shirtless for Chandigarh. Uh, here in a room, his office at uh, Cap Martin uh, in the south of France, uh, about what I estimate because I didn't see the plan, two meters by three meters, okay? Two meters by three meters. That's, that was the private office of Le Corbusier. There is, but, but before we go to the alarmingly provocative statement next, I would like to, you to take another look at this window, because this window tells me a lot about the next statement, which we are going to read together. There is nothing more lamentable than this mania of today to design tradition for the sole purpose of creating the coveted new. He published this here. These are his words in his book, Journey to the East. Let me read it again, because this to me was shocking. Coming from Le Corbusier, there is nothing more lamentable than this mania of today to disown tradition for the sole purpose of creating the coveted new. So here we have a Le Corbusier who at 22 or 23 or so was almost critical of the future Le Corbusier, apparently but shows clearly that Le Corbusier was not against tradition. I mean, in fact, he, he lamented that there is nothing more lamentable than to disown tradition. How do you explain this? We move forward. This is the plan of the hut of Le Corbusier, Le Cabanon, as it was called. Well, around 16 square meters, if I'm not mistaken. That's it smaller than a living room uh, in a banal block of flats in Bucharest. And uh, this is his office. Can you believe it? Maybe even Heidegger would not have believed it. It's even more modest than uh, Heidegger's room. So, you know, <laughs> St. Francis of Assisi, Martin Heidegger, and uh, Charles Edouard Genre, Le Corbusier all living very, very, very modestly, at least at this stage in their lives. And yes, Le Corbusier had an office in Paris too, but even that one was modest. You know, a corridor in a former monastery on Rue de Sèvres. Um, but, but he loved this place. And this is not his house, this is his office. I approximately, I, I approximate it, it to be two meters by three meters. I don't think I was too wrong about it. How, how was it possible? I don't think, I think that the most uh, insignificant or, uh, no, I shouldn't use this word, the most uh, 
an accomplished uh, architect in, in, in Romania, for example, or anywhere in the world would refuse to work in such a space, would feel dwarfed, would feel humiliated, but not Le Corbusier. And I actually think was splendid, splendid there. It is true, the landscape is magnificent and he was seeing through that anachronistic window, the Mediterranean Sea, this we should not ignore. But otherwise, you know, the, the, the building is, we, we can't, I'm not even sure we can call it a building. You know, it was probably transported by four vigorous men down those uh, stairs, those, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, one man in each corner of the, of the, of the, uh, of the little uh, structure. That's it, because you see, it doesn't even have a foundation. That's okay. It's really okay. Um, so we move forward. This is the plan. He actually had, he said that he built this first for his wife, but uh, actually he used it more. His wife died before him and uh, he used it, uh, you know, just for himself. Uh, it was planned to have two twin size beds as you can see, but one was removed from what I know. There was a sink here, here the toilet without a door, of course. Here was a, a door uh, giving access to a little restaurant where he took uh, food from. And it was true, it was a luxury, a, a convenience. He was not cooking, to cook well, there was no kitchen here. And uh, you know, some, you think these are chairs? <laughs> They are not chairs. I mean, this is a desk indeed, but these are not chairs. These are just two wooden boxes. He sat on wooden boxes, no chairs. Can you imagine? Yes, you better imagine. No ergonomic chair at all, no. Uh, and these are some images. Uh, the great building from, uh, from uh, outside, I think this is even him. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I think St. Francis would, would have felt at home here. And Heidegger perhaps too. And isn't it beautiful, a great saint, a great philosopher and a great architect, all sharing in a way the wisdom to understand that you know, we are small particle in the universe and we shouldn't be so inflated with our, with our you know, lungs and then feel so important because the truth of the matter is we are just blade of grass. We are just blades of grass, nothing else. Maybe even a blade of grass is a little more than we are. Uh, so look at the building. Now, if a student in the first year would submit such a project at one point in his, uh, uh, you know, illustrious uh, educational career, it would probably be dismissed. You know, I'm almost sure that, uh, you know, if a student uh, claims, has the nerve to claim that this is architecture and that this is a building he conceived, he would be sent home with laughter. But this is a building built uh, by Le Corbusier when he was over 60 and he lived there, you know, until he died. He died in front of this building while swimming in the Mediterranean Sea at 78 is through. Uh, you know, I am asking myself, why is it that this building, uh, just as it is, would be an inappropriate, uh, you know, uh, diploma work now after six long years of study? Why not? Because we think that, you know, the more you advance in your studies, the, build, the bigger has, the, the bigger the building should become. Why? because architecture is about quality, it's not about quantity. And here we have the clear example that a very sophisticated, unaccomplished and creative, and not even very modest architect, that is Le Corbusier, he built this thing for him. And I think this building is highly uh, relevant to our time because we talk about sustainability, right? We talk about ecology, right? We talk about climate change, we write, Right, we talk about melting icebergs, right? We talk about the rising levels of the sea. So how come the Le Corbusier was, uh, was, was probably happy to live in this uh, little space because it is little, it is small. Look at its elevations, you know? 
he was an acrobat in the sense of the poem he wrote that Doshi told us about. Bravo to him. I think, again, Heidegger, Le Corbusier, and Saint Francis, they all say the same thing. We should be modest and we should be creative and should be enjoying life beyond our ridiculous uh, quest for uh, frivolous comfort and uh, all the trappings of the so-called civilization. Let's not forget what Alvar Aalto said, architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. And this is the project of the first year student called um, uh, Le Corbusier, Le Cabanon de Roc uh, Brune, he built in, in 1952. Uh, and, uh, I, it, in my opinion, it creates a beautiful parallel to the to Heidegger's uh, hut. Now it's true, the landscape is a different story altogether. It is majestic. It is the Mediterranean Sea at its best. But the building, the building bows its head in front of the landscape. That's what it does. And it does the right thing. This is this is Le Corbusier's hut. He only lived his through several months a year here, but this says a lot, it does. And I'm absolutely sure he was very happy here. I would be too. Look at the windows. Are these the modernistic windows that uh, he himself was advocating? Not at all. I mean, these are these are windows just like again my grandmother had in a in a village near Sibiu, uh, not different at all. I love the Cabanon. In my opinion, the Cabanon is a more radical and more significant and more interesting and more everything building than Villa Savoy. Uh, to me, Villa Savoy is rather stiff, uh, dogmatic, excessively white. Uh, rigid, uh, frigid, I had visited it, it's cold. This building is more radical and more enjoyable and more romantic and more everything. Look at the interior. Now, of course, the interior is, some people might think is, is Spartan. Yes, uh, because he was a creative man, not a man who loved to lay on the, on the bed, on a king size bed, you know, uh, all his life, no. That was not Le Corbusier, an artwork by him there, and uh, you know some collections from the from the beach. Look at his ergonomic chairs, two wooden boxes. That's it. You would say, wait a minute, I can't sit on that for more than uh, ten minutes. Well, apparently the great architect was able to sit more than just ten minutes. Anyway, uh, sorry about the resolution of these pictures. Uh, again, the magnificent uh, landscape with a with a with a corner of uh, of, of his uh, private office. <laughs> ah, life can be so beautiful if we just uh, understand our true dimensions in the world, because we are really very 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 small, and it's something very beautiful about being very 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 small. We are talking about Le Corbusier here, are we not? And before we were talking about Heidegger, were we not? And before we were talking about St. Francis, were we not? Three human beings who achieved uh, glory, I would say, but at the same time, they, 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 they understood that, you know, uh, true life is not about acquiring things and getting rich and all the rest. You know, the riches of the mind and of the heart are much, 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 much more important. Art, art in this little hut, there is art, art made by Le Corbusier. Here he is sitting on the ergonomic chair, the wooden box. <laughs> Isn't he beautiful? Because he's like a child doing his, his homework. Of course, he has some flowers here. He probably picked up the flowers himself something we very, very rarely do because there is nowhere to pick them up from. And the little sink and the window here and uh, <laughs> no shirt, just shorts, enjoying himself in very simple terms, available to anyone, absolutely anyone, doesn't matter on what lat latitude or longitude. 
another if but the window uh, the window has its sophistication you know with a mirror here and uh, even this uh, vertical thing here opening on the right side to see the uh, to see the sea and you know i think every little well he has electricity which is something it is a luxury he could have perhaps uh, done even without electricity. Well, he has, I imagine that's electricity. Again, the, the, the office of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the great architect. Here he is uh, contemplating his, uh, his oeuvre, his, uh, his uh, quarters, his house. <laughs> Remember Martin Heidegger, right? Well, here is Le Corbusier. Uh, and uh, another look at his ergonomic chairs, highly sophisticated, designed by a very important Italian designer and produced for a lot of money by a luxurious uh, manufacturer of uh, furniture. Here is the artwork. Of course, I was sarcastic. I was ironical. Isn't modern art beautiful when it ornates even the most uh, modest of, of quarters? Because again, the life of the spirit is what counts. It doesn't matter how you live, how modest the quarters you, uh, you, you are in. You can still create. And he created with joy. Unfortunately, he also vandalized the walls of the villa built by Eileen Gray, not too far away from here. Some people think he vandalized them, uh, the, those walls. Uh, I would say that maybe not. Uh, he after, after all, he also so-called vandalized his own walls here. This is the interest into his house. And this is, uh, uh, I, I imagine these were doors, but they were not used, um, you know, uh, of the restaurant. He was probably the only client of the restaurant. And you saw there was a door connecting directly uh, his uh, hut with the so-called restaurant. That's it. So. It's not his birthday, but I just wanted to show, by the way, of Heidegger, also Le Corbusier's hat. So thank you very much for, uh, for being here.